Thank you for tuning in to the volume. Again, I'm your host, Brad Franklin, the managing editor of the Jackson Advocate. I am joined, as always, by Joshua Martin, our content engagement editor. And as we promised at the top of the show, we are joined by Representative Zakia Summers. Thank you for joining us. Happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Great, great. And of course, uh, the legislature has just started, and uh, you are taking some time out of your day in between sessions to come and speak with us, so we appreciate that. Absolutely. But we just wanted to, uh, for our listeners, we wanted to kind of dive a little bit into what's going to be happening in this legislative session in 2022. Uh, from redistricting to income tax cuts to medical marijuana to critical race theory. There's a lot of things that you guys are going to be talking about in this session. So I, I want to kind of get your uh, your thoughts on where you think, you know, your particular focus is on some uh, some push button issues for you and some of the issues that are going to be affecting, uh, you know, the larger portion of your district, uh, you know, in the state of Mississippi. But let's just start right off uh, for you. Walking through the doors uh, on day one in the legislative session, uh, what are a couple of, of hot topics that you definitely are looking forward to addressing? You know, walking through the state house on the first day is kind of like the first day of school. You mm-hmm. know, everybody mm-hmm. is excited. You know, we we're hugging, we're shaking hands, we're so happy to see each other. Um, but we also know that we're going to have a lot ahead of us as we go through the session. Um, a lot of the issues that you talked about in the introduction, you know, are the same issues that I'm going to be focused on as well. Mm-hmm. Um, medical marijuana. Um, we haven't heard a whole lot about the ballot initiative process, but right. that's a very important topic for me because as a as a voting rights advocate, I think that the people should have um the opportunity to be able to impact policy, and so let's, let's that's talk, one of the ways to do that. Let's talk about that real quick before yeah. we get into the issue. The medical marijuana issue has been a controversial topic. Yes. Uh, it was voted on by an overwhelming majority uh, of the voters, and then, of course, a lot of other things took place, and a lot of people don't understand the political rankings that take place. So before we go into that, for those who voted and those that saw that an overwhelming majority of people voted for this bill, what happened? to get us to the point now where we're talking about having to put another ballot initiative in place. So essentially what happened was we had a lawsuit. We had the mayor of Madison to sue uh, to stop the uh, medical marijuana program mm-hmm. because on the basis of that, there was a, a error in the Constitution where the legislature had not corrected the number of congressional districts. And so when the medical marijuana program was out in the community and we saw the uh, individuals that were getting and gathering signatures, they were operating from five congressional districts. And so in order for an issue to go on the ballot initiative, according to the Constitution, you have to have a certain amount of signatures from each district. And as you all know, we are in we have four congressional districts, not five. We used to. Right. Um, right. but due to the population decrease, right. we lost a congressional seat. So we have four congressional districts. And the Supreme Court ruled in favor of that lawsuit, which put a stop, a big red stop on the medical marijuana program. And so in order for the program to continue, it now has to be legislated. And, you know, in many ways, my perspective is that this was the game plan from the beginning. Right, um, right. They, you know, the, the some folks in the state of Mississippi never wanted a medical marijuana program because they think it's going to lead to recreational use. Right. Um, and they really don't see the benefits of having access to medical marijuana for our very ill um, right. citizens in the state of Mississippi. Right. And so since we've been out of session, the Senate and the House or certain Senate and House members have been going back and forth on drafting uh, a piece of legislation that actually does a lot more than what the program um, that citizens voted on would do. Um, And I think it makes it a little bit more comprehensive. Where we are right now is that the Senate has a bill drafted. Uh, They sent it to the governor. Um, to get his okay, because in this process, you want to make sure that legislative leadership um, are amenable to what you're trying to get passed so that you don't have any issues on the tail end. Well, the governor came back and said that he didn't like the bill because of the amount of marijuana that's allowed for individuals to be able to receive, which is 3.5 grams. 
Um, when I spoke with the chairman of the Drug Policy Committee on the House side, he said that in his research, you know, we are kind of right in the middle. There are some states that allow, like Oklahoma allows eight. Right. I think California allows a lot, lot. Right. And so we're kind of on the more conservative side. Right. And he felt that, you know, we've done, that members have done all that they can to really craft a, a program that will be fitting for the state of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So um, at this point, we are hoping that the governor will come around. Um, we don't know if there are any more changes going to be done. You know, legislation has its ebbs and flows yes. all throughout yes. the session. Right. Um, but if it does stay intact and we're able to vote on it, then we have to think about will the governor veto it if it does right. not include the changes that he wants. Which he said pretty much that he's going to do. Right. That's not what he wants. So what, what happens in this case, because it really feels like we're at an impasse here. Uh, the bill has kind of been shifted as far as it can possibly go to be yeah. effective. And the governor has said that it's you know not effective enough for him. So do you see this bill ultimately stalling? And do you ultimately see the power of the people being quelled because of this? I think that the bill will go through the process and will pass as is. I don't think that uh, House members nor senators are willing to make any more changes on it because they've done all that they can do. Um, if they do make a change, I think it'll be minimal. Um, so, so we have two scenarios. They don't make changes. It goes through. The governor gets upset. He vetoes it. Right. Then we have to determine, do we have the votes to override it? I think we have the votes in the House to override it. I think the Senate is a little shaky, so we're still kind of you know, monitoring that. The other scenario is that we make the changes that the governor wants, we appease him, he and he signs it. Right, right. So we'll see. I, I think at the end of the day, we will have a program. So I think my question was, and I, I think for our listeners as well, uh, there is an opportunity for the Senate and uh, the representatives to override the governor's veto. Yes. If he does veto the bill. Yes. So that actually does leave some hope on the table that this will pass. Absolutely. Good. And Good. if you remember, you know, we had um, the, the legislature on both sides, both houses, had some extreme pushback against the governor when he mm -hmm. came to the CARES funding. Right. And ultimately, the legislature won. And so I think that uh, the speaker and lieutenant governor are, you know, willing to do whatever they need to do um, to make sure that, you know, um, that, that we're being appropriate in how we legislate. But we're also not just, you know, putting our tail, putting our tail in between our legs right. and, and running right. away from what the governor you right. know, wants to do. Right. Now, you talked about uh, there now being four congressional districts in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, redistricting is going to be a huge issue yes. in this legislative session. So I just want to kind of get your thoughts on where we're at. Um, you know, the census came out, of course. We did lose population in the state of Mississippi. Yes. Uh, a lot of counties, including Hines, lost a lot of population. So that has us where we are right now. And that could prove to be uh, very detrimental when it comes to voting. Uh, Absolutely. In, in the upcoming election. So I want to give your thoughts on that and what do you think uh, you can look forward to when these redistricting, redistricting conversations take place? Sure. So, in fact, in Congressional District 2, which is Congressman Thompson's district, he lost 65,000 people um, in that district. That's a lot it of is. people. Yes. And, you know, we know what we were dealing with when we were doing the census. We had COVID on top of that. We okay. didn't really have the investment to go into communities to make sure that people counted. But anyway, the, the numbers show that there was a loss of 65,000 people. Mm -hmm. So uh, the redistricting committee um, met over the last few months since we've been out of the last session, and that's composed of House members and Senate members. Um, and they have come up with a map that makes some changes to um, all of the congressional districts really, but um, the most changes are in CD2. Mm -hmm. And what the map shows is that uh, Congressional District gets a little bit more of Hines County, not all of Hines County, but a little bit more, yeah. and they attached four additional counties that are in the southwest corner mm -hmm. of the state uh, into Congressional District 2, which makes Congressional District 2 so large right. that it would be very difficult for even Congressman Thompson, and we know he's been in the game for a long time, right, right. to be able to campaign from the top of yes. the state to the bottom yes. of the state, literally. 
Um, and, and we know that that's by design course, as well. And so, you know, we have to stay on top of this issue. And I also encourage all of the constituents to make contact with their legislators, whether they're on the redistricting committee. I'm on the elections committee, but I'm not on the redistricting committee. But whether or not they're on either committee or not, because this map could come to the floor and we will be forced to vote on it. And, you know, people need to know how their legislator is going to vote on it if it's presented as is. We do have an opportunity to make changes um, and to get with the chairman of the committee, which is Representative Jim Beckett, um, to see if he will be willing to incorporate those changes. Um, ultimately, we can vote yes, we can vote no. Um, but of course, uh, you, you know the numbers in the legislature. We're dealing with a supermajority Republican legislator. So um, essentially, they don't need our votes to right. be able to pass what they want to pass. But right. that doesn't mean that we don't that, that we give up the fight. So we have to, as I say, continue to monitor this and see what happens. This plan that was presented by the committee is not the plan that Congressman Thompson wanted, nor the plan that aligns with what the NAACP had recommended. Uh, Congressman Thompson wants all of Hines County, which makes sense to me because voters know that, you know, depending on the election, you never know which precinct you may be voting in because we have all of these split counties, split precincts, and it could even go to the granular level of the street that you on splits, right, right. whether or not you're in CD2 or CD3. And so I think that it's important to make counties whole so yeah. that voters don't have to do that because right. what happens is the vote, the voters end up getting suppressed mm -hmm. because they get frustrated behind the process right. where they don't understand what has happened and then they just don't go vote. Right. So it's a very important issue. Um, you know, we've been told that it's one of the first issues we're going to take up this session. Mm -hmm. um, I know that a bill has already been dropped in the Senate. I haven't seen it dropped in the House yet. It doesn't need to be dropped in the House yet. It could pass the Senate and just come over to the other side. But um, it's one of our top priorities for sure. Yeah. Now, you talk about the supermajority uh, yeah, up at the Capitol and the fact that you know, a lot of these bills can't get passed without any Democrat support. Uh, one of the things that we've talked about with some of our past guests, we've had Senator Blunt on, we've had uh, Representative Chris Bell, we've had Senator John Horn on, and one of the things that we've talked about, especially dealing with the water and sewer issue that we're dealing with in Jackson, Mississippi, is the uh, tumultuous relationship that exists between you know the Jackson contingent and a lot of the Democrats in the House and the Senate and that Republican supermajority and a lot of times coming to terms on things that are going to help the city of Jackson or monies that are going to come to the city of Jackson. How have you been trying to help navigate uh, those relationships as it relates to, you know, getting things passed and getting things, especially for those things particularly needed for the city of Jackson? Absolutely. So, I mean, you're absolutely right. And the state has not been very friendly with the city of Jackson, you know, not just over the last couple of years before quite some time, which is why the city is in the situation that it's in right now. Um, you know, what I've been doing is just talking with members, um, particularly on the other side of the aisle, and just really giving my perspective that, you know, we need their help, that, you know, the, the Democrats and the delegation from the city or from the county, we can't do it alone, you know, in order for us to get some of the support that we need, that we desperately need, particularly for water, sewer infrastructure, um, we need their help. Right, and, right. you know, the bottom line is that all of them come to Jackson to work and play and live and eat. And right. so whatever happens in Jackson affects all of the legislators. Um, in fact, it, it affects everybody that's in the state of Mississippi because how Jackson goes is the way that Mississippi is going to go. So we've been having those conversations with them. Um, I also have some colleagues that have been meeting with the leadership trying to determine how best we present our case um, to ask for funding for water and sewer. Mm -hmm. We know that the state has received uh, $1.8 billion mm -hmm. uh, from federal funding that we should be able to take advantage of. And so um, we are going back and forth between the city and leadership to find out exactly how much money we need and what we need to ask for. You know, we, we likely won't get everything that we need, right. but if we can get a, a huge chunk, that would be you know, very much helpful to yeah. the city of Jackson. That's definitely one of the things that, you know, we have talked about here and going to continue to talk about is that relationship, you know, as it relates to the city of Jackson. I think, you know, another one of those key elements that presents, uh, you know, that conflict 
uh, is the critical race theory. Uh, that's something that you guys are going to actually be talking about. It's something that currently doesn't even really exist right. in the state of Mississippi, but yet Tate Reeves, uh, you know, and the speaker seem to think this issue is important enough for you guys to actually vote on it. So when you see something like this happening, something that does not exist, and you guys are basically going to be talking about a non-issue and making it into an issue. Kind of talk a little bit about what your thoughts are on this critical race theory issue and, and how y'all are going to approach it. Right. So CRT is not being taught in our K-12 schools. Let's let's make that very clear. Um, this issue is really just a divisive issue. It is meant to continue to divide us. Um, and we've been I mean, we're often divided on issues, right? But, you know, at this point in time when there's so much money at play and there's a surplus of funds that have come into the state, we don't need anything that divides us. Right. You know, I am willing to bet that a bill will be dropped and it will likely pass. I think our goal is just to make sure that it is as weak as possible. Um You know, we've heard from some colleagues that say, you know, we really shouldn't make a big fuss about it. From my perspective, I don't think that we have we need to keep silent on this issue. You know, why 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 would they say don't make a big issue of it? That seems weird. Because it could have an effect on later legislation. Mm -hmm. You know, if we if we go to bat about this, then we may not be able to get X, Y, and Z. But at the end of the day, we're not really getting anything in the first place. So right, it's like, right. what do we have to lose? Right. Um, so, you know, I have been talking to talking about this issue with a lot of different folks from across the country. And, you know, I've already put together a, a list of questions that can be asked from the floor if it does make it to the calendar. Um, because I think that it's important, even if it does pass, I think that it's important for it whichever individual that's going to be presenting the bill, that they be put on record for exactly the way that they feel and they think and they legislate about black and brown people. Right. Um, Now, I don't know if if you've been made aware, Brad, but I received an email where MDE is already looking at some proposed changes on their social security. I'm not social security, excuse me, social studies Mm -hmm. curriculum. Mm -hmm. Um, And today, actually, Wednesday, January 5th, is the deadline to request a public hearing on these changes. And some of these changes do reflect taking out some of those teachings that are centered on black and brown people's history and infusing that with uh, patriot patriotism education, which is something that the governor, uh, uh, Governor Tate Reeves, has been pushing. And, And that's definitely not what we need in the state of Mississippi. And you would think that after 2020, when we were able to take down the Confederate state flag and we worked together on a bipartisan level to uh, make those changes and put something up that's representative Mm -hmm. of a united Mississippi, that we would continue that trajectory of working together. We even heard from the speaker yesterday on the first day of session that we should be more unified, we should be one Mississippi. And, you know, that's all That's all well, you know, when we hear that, but how is that going to play out in this session? So, you know, I I think that we just have to go to bat on CRT and we just let the chips fall where they may. Right. Josh and I, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we talked about in our end-of-year wrap-up show about, you know, the flag, the Confederate flag being taken down and what we thought might possibly be next steps mm-hmm. and if this was going to create some uh you know some positive momentum right uh <clears throat> yes of course so i think uh that it's a sign that mississippi is changing that we are growing and i agree with the points that you made that uh this issue is just another way for us to be divided when we in actuality should be coming together and um in my personal opinion i think that it's wrong that um you Describe it as patriot, um, patriotism yeah. education. Patriotism education. I think that's that's kind of wrong. I think that we should be, um, uh, you know, uh, pushing those black stories, those uh, those uh, accomplishments that uh, black and brown people have uh, achieved and that are still relevant in today's society. So that aspect of it is is kind of uh, out of whack. But uh, yes, this is uh, just something once again to just. Uh, take our minds off the bigger issue which exactly. is coming together right. and find a solution. It is more so indoctrination than it is. Yes. <laughs> and, and, else, really. and 
you know, we we can't get lost in the fact that it's not currently te- taught in K-12. Right, like, exactly. they know that it's not currently taught in exactly. K-12 exactly. because the superintendent of education has already told them that it's not. But what my concern is what this bill could do is prevent future teachings around right. race right. that our children need to be made aware of mm-hmm. and need to be educated on. Because what this all boils down to is control and power. Mm -hmm. If they can remove teachings and the history of black and brown people and children learning about how enfranchisement came about for our own people, then you're losing voters. And if you're losing voters, you know, black and brown voters, then that means you can't have the representation that you need and deserve to be able to bring those issues that impact our communities the most to the table. Right. So it's all about how can we long, long term mm-hmm. control and have power over people. Well, what do we do? Because I always see the Republicans thinking five and six steps ahead. Even when we're talking about this critical race theory issue not currently being thought, taught, but putting something in place that will affect what happens maybe five or six years down the line. And I've talked with Senator Blunt about this as far as, you know, those on the other side of the aisle with Democrats and younger generations, you know, like Josh, seeing these things and these mechanisms taking place in uh, our legislature. What is being done on the Democratic side, you know, on your side, and you come from a a history of advocacy work, you know, what is being done to kind of look forward and be kind of progressive in the bills that we are presenting and some of the thought processes that the Democratic lawmakers have. Yes, so we are, you know, constantly having meetings, talking about the issues and legislation that we want to uh, propose and pass. Uh, We have to be very strategic in the legislature because, as we said earlier, we don't have the numbers. And so sometimes Mm -hmm. that means that we have to get our colleagues across the aisle to introduce legislation or to um, speak with leadership about things that we want to get done just so that we can get it done. We may not have our name on it, um, but, you know, it, it's important to our communities. And so, therefore, it's important to us. But I tell you, one thing that, you know, we've got to stop doing is waiting around to the last minute to right. do things. Right. Um, it, there's an old, you know, adage that says if you if you plan to fail, you if you fail to plan, right. you plan right. to right. fail. Right. I want to make sure I got that right, Josh. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, even for the city of Jackson and for Hines County, I have not heard of a 5, 10, or 25-year strategic or comprehensive plan right. for any of those jurisdictions. And policy has to be a part of that. And so, you know, I have been really trying to push our leaders to start thinking that way because you're right. It seems like at every turn, they're two steps ahead of us and we're right. trying to catch up right. or we're being reactionary instead of being, exactly. you know, um, exactly. instead of, instead of uh, planning uh, ahead. Right. And so, you know, that's one of the things that we that we really need to do because we need to know where where we're going, where we want to go. And I think those conversations are happening in silos. Mm-hmm. Um we got to get out of the silo mentality and, you know, really begin to work, right. you know, as a unit. Right, right. Uh, the last thing I want to touch on, of course, is teacher pay. Again, you know, your work in the advocacy field, you know, you, you talked about this before. Where do you see this issue, you know, going in this session? Tate Reeves, you know, has done a few things to kind of move, you know, the bar forward for teachers and a few little pay raises here and there. But we still know the struggles that these teachers are experiencing right yeah. now. They're still severely underpaid when it comes to the national average. And I think as a profession, underpaid across the board. But what are some things that you are, are hoping and looking to see happen in this session with teacher pay? I think teacher pay will get done this session. And I think it's going to be more than $1,000. We've already heard from leadership saying that they are in support of teacher pay. Um, So I think that that's going to happen, particularly since the state is flush with so much money. Um, What I'm what I'm really concerned about is this income tax elimination proposal that we've heard from the speaker and the governor. Um, And and if that passes, what we're looking at is a deficit of about two billion dollars, if not more. Um, And then we got to determine how do we fill that gap? 
Um, if something like that passes, I mean, that's a lot of money. You're talking about a lot of different agencies being affected, mm -hmm. particularly. The speaker is uh, really gone. Oh, yeah, that's his baby and he's mm -hmm. rocking it. And, you know, he's so much, uh, he's so, so concerned about that, that he isn't really talking about mm -hmm. anything right. else. Right. Um, but we know that uh, agencies like public education, health department affect black folk and they don't need any cuts. Um, and so we need to. Uh, make sure that we monitor that and not just be willing to say, oh, well, it's going to be um, a, a decrease in the grocery tax. And so we would be willing to give up our income tax. We can't have swaps like that right. because our tax system is already set up to be regressive and it puts a it shifts a burden on poor people. So we just got to make sure that, you know, what we do with this money is going to be very important. It, it could change the trajectory for the state of Mississippi mm -hmm. if we do the right thing. Right. We're going to keep our eyes on it, definitely. Uh, Representative Zakia Summers, thank you for joining us thank on the you. volume. We're definitely going to have you back as this session continues and as things change and as dynamics change. We'll have you here so that you can inform our listeners on what's happening up in the Capitol. All thank right. you so much. This has been the volume. We'll be right back.